Thanks for staying with us. Now, supply chain management is the man management of the flow of goods and services and includes all processes that transform raw materials into final product. It involves the, um, the active streamlining of a business supply side activities to maximize customer value and gain a competitive advantage in the marketplace. Small and mid-sized companies today are just now starting to tap the value of developing and executing supply chain excellence strategies as large enterprises have been doing for years. Um, as the letter companies experiences have demonstrated the highly effective supply chain um, allows a company to operate at the peak um, performance. So how can we help more small businesses tap into this strategy and what are the growth opportunities available you know, in this, um, this business? Now, please let us hear what you have to say. Remember, you can join this conversation. Tweet at us at WayShowAfrica1 with the hashtag WayShow or send us an SMS or WhatsApp to 81 So I'm going to bring in our guest like in a minute. I just wanted to hear your overview, Lamy, about you know uh, supply chain and what what understanding you have. We are here to learn. <laughs> Ooh, uh, <laughs> Me, I'm here to learn. Right? When you brought up the topic, the only thing I knew about supply chain mm. is logistics. Mm. So when I started doing my research, it was way, way, way beyond that. It goes from when you from the raw suppliers. I'm sorry, raw Material. material suppliers All the up way. to the end user. Yes. So it's a whole long chain. long chain mm -hmm. and particularly with the effect of COVID is really really done a lot of damage particularly to us in Africa a lot of us just look down to look up to China mm. for our supplies and all that and the chain is a bit broken at the moment so we're all struggling so I think we have to look about look into creative you know approaches on how to mitigate the effect of um, mm. supply chain disruption Disruption, right? It is, yeah. <laughs> Disruption and all that. Because, you know, usually I didn't know that, it was that technical. It is. It's, it's a very technical conversation. I was overwhelmed. <laughs> like, what? I just thought supply chain was coming from point A uh, point to point B. 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 Yeah. It was it's just, mm -hmm. it's just logistics now, arranging the, you know. I didn't know it was very technical. <laughs> me Some people about. are even professionals in that area. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. All right, so we'll bring in our guest, Inkira Madi Amina, is the head of Eastern Operations at Kobo 360, taxed with overseeing the operations and business activities in this region. She manages logistics operations of all key clients, identifying and developing new business opportunities and ensuring profitability. She manages the overall operations of the region and um, uh, her team members. And she's joined us live in studio. Thank you so much, Inkiru, for joining us. <laughs> You. So you heard Lamia, you were chuckling. <laughs> like, what she's saying? What she, you know, <laughs> yeah. this your topic is so technical. I'm here to just ah, be like this and be listening. <laughs> but you know, the truth is, um, what this, um, when, the, when the conversation was brought to the table for us to have that conversation, yeah. I was just wondering, okay, if for anything, you see, this is a part of the blessings of COVID. COVID is beginning to show us things that we never thought existed or things that we just overlooked and didn't look at it that this is a big market, mm -hmm. this is a big business, mm -hmm. you know. So maybe you should just give us like an overview, mm -hmm. you know, general overview of what's, what a supply chain management system should look like. Okay, so I think that that's fantastic. And you actually, your intro was amazing, the way you described mm -hmm. what the supply chain is. It's a fantastic description. Um, you know, interestingly, um, supply chain is literally the backbone of every economy. Um, I think in Nigeria now, supply chain or logistics sector um, accounts for about 4% of the country's GDP, which is about $18 billion now. And it's the same across many countries in Africa and the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. um, so what supply chain is essentially, is like you mentioned, mm. the way goods are produced and distributed down to your table here is powered by supply chain. So there are basically different aspects in the supply chain. There's logistics and transportation that we all know, which is transporting your products from point A to, to point B, B and the different means by which you transport your product, whether you're using road, air, rail, sea. Um, supply chain also in includes um, what you call sourcing. Um, well, well, let's start from manufacturing, which is actually um, producing the raw materials that end up being the finished goods that are delivered to your household. And of course, before you produce the raw materials, there's a sourcing aspect as well um, that basically has to do with sourcing the raw materials that you're going to um, impute in your manufacturing activity. So all of these different buckets are essentially what make up your supply chain for any industry. 
Um, for what we find, or what I found um, with our company is that the supply chain industry, specifically in Africa, is what we call fragmented. Mm. And it's fragmented because, first of all, the barriers to entry into the market or industry is very low. Mm. So you can have anyone come and handle any of these buckets, whether you have you know, someone waking up today, today to say, I want to be a trucker, mm -hmm. or you have someone saying, I want to set up a network of warehouses mm -hmm. and service these um, specific clients. So what we see is that this fragmentation or these fragmented activities um, is what is responsible for the inefficiencies that you see in your supply chain because there's no, um, there's no professionalism, there's no way to control the quality of service that's being delivered. Most people don't even understand the activities that they are a part of. Mm -hmm. um, so I think for my company, Kobo 360, what we've seen is that there must be a way for technology to organize all of these in inefficiencies mm. that end up better serving the end client. Mm. And by serving the end client, we're talking about, okay, how do you produce faster? How do you distribute your Stricter. products faster? How do you ensure you have visibility over the movement of your products from point A to, to point, point B? B. Mm. Um, so what we did essentially is we built a technology platform um, that first of all, you know, caters to the transportation side of the supply chain. Mm. And what that looks like is um, you aggregate all these small players in the transportation um, bucket and you provide a technology that matches them with the demand from your clients. So your clients could be um, someone in the FMCG, FMCG sector, or someone in the um, cement production sector and the like. Or fashion. Or fashion sector as well. So the platform basically aggregates all these uh, service providers and then provides one-stop shop for clients to um, shop. So exactly, by clients, to what, do you, what do you mean by clients? Are you dealing with the big companies or you're going all the way to the, you know, the small or end users? When you talk about Cobalt 360, mm -hmm. what are your, who are your clients? Mm -hmm. So our clients are um, pretty much... I would say anyone that needs to move or that has a stake in the supply chain. Mm. Um, although now, majority of our client segment is, uh, are the big name brands. For mm. example, um, the flour mills of Nigeria, mm. Honeywell, so larger companies. companies. But we do also allow for servicing of, you know, a one mom and pop shop that wants to move from, maybe okay. move her products from one point to another, mm. you know, in smaller quantities and in smaller volumes, mm. as opposed to the larger volumes that, you know, the big name brands would do. You know, you know why I asked that question? Because we're trying to see how we can also um, get small businesses, right, small um, that are not big um, corporates. Because when I was reading through supply mm -hmm. chain, you know, when they say our quote that says everybody needs it, but they do not just know that they mm -hmm. need um, supply chain. Small businesses actually are if they had a proper company like you um, putting that structure for them, mm -hmm. you know, it, it, in the long run, it, it helps the company become a lot more profitable and taking away a lot of stress from their head. But they are not seeing it now because maybe they feel like, okay, I cannot approach a Cobalt 360. Yeah. They're too big for me and all of that. Yeah. In terms of pricing, right? Would your company do the same with, uh, I mean, in, in terms of price? Because I know with logistics, volumes actually makes your your transportation costs cheaper. Cheaper, yes. Right? But now if you're going to go and deal with a mom and pop shop, you know, <laughs> wouldn't it be expensive for that person to be able to engage your services? Mm -hmm. um, so to answer that, um, no. Because what we've done is we've allowed for our pricing to be extremely fair. Mm. And in doing that, we sort of have, um, you know, a technology stack that basically measures over a period of time the average price to move from one point to another um, for a specific route. So we use that as a benchmark, um, you know, for pricing that we offer our clients. So we don't go with the sense of, okay, if you want to move just one cargo, you know, we're going to shoot the price high because we know that it's just small volume that you're giving us. Mm. We use our price pricing technology to determine the best rate mm -hmm. um, for the consignment that you want to move based on the routes and based on the average price for that route on our platform. Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, <laughs> of course, I like the introduction of um, technology. It makes it simpler. But there's still all this element of the Nigerian element and all that. So what are the stumbling blocks you encounter in this business? Mm. 
Um, okay, we'll start with technology, then we'll look at the other, you know, <laughs> stumbling blocks around regulation and things like that. Um, because um, the Nigerian market, unfortunately, has low tech adoption, where there are not a lot of people that are tech savvy that understand, you know, how to use tech to their benefit. Um, we noticed that at the early stages of our, um, you know, launch and activities as a business, and we devised sort of like a tech strategy that allowed us to build a solution that even the most non-tech savvy person can use. So even if you don't have a smartphone, but you have a mobile device, um, you can use the USSD functionality to request an order. If you're a driver, you can use the USSD, USSD functionality to accept an order from a client um, to change the status of that order, whether it's en route, whether it has been delivered, um, and the like. So what we've done is, um, with the challenge of tech adoption, we've we strategize to build a product that caters to everyone, um, depending on, regardless of, you know, your level of tech savviness, right? So, so how do you cope? You mentioned drivers. I was going to say, how do you cope with that? Because <laughs> we see a, a lot of menace, these people you know, are that's, on the road. So that's interesting. Nigeria is unique. <laughs> How do you bring these people together? Okay, mm. Most of them are not educated. So yeah. how do you? That's, that's very unique. I think for us, what, what we do is, because we're like um, a three-sided marketplace where yours, you are working with you know, your service providers, which in this case is your truck owners or your drivers, you're working with your truck owner. So there's the driver, there's the truck owner, and, the and there's the client right, that you're working with. So what we've done is we've, embodied an approach that sees every single um, you know, player in our ecosystem as a customer, right? So if you're a driver, you are Copper 360's customer. customer. And we treat you, you know, like a customer. Everybody knows that the customer is king. Mm. And we treat you like the customer. So I think to handle the quote-unquote menace that people often have to deal with when it comes to drivers is to get to the point where you understand them, you understand what their needs are, and you cater specifically to that need. So I think that's what we've done, where for each of our customers, we make it a habit to understand what your specific need is, and then we cater to that need. So for a driver now, his need could be, once I get to you know, the offloading point, can you ensure that I offload within a specific time so that I'm not you know, wasting time on the utilization of my asset? And you ensure that you meet that need. If he offloads, his need could also be, can you give me reverse logistics, you know, to carry back to my originating point, and we meet that need. Um, so, yeah, it's just to understand the individual needs of each of our users and make sure that we cater to their specific needs. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> so, so um, we have a question on um, one of our co-anchors. She was supposed to be part of us. She says the African... Uh, adoption of the African continental free trade zone um, does not equate to an upgrade in our infrastructure. So what will change? You know, mm. do, you, do you have an idea of what she's talking about? She's yeah. the SME person. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So for the trade agreement mm -hmm. that's being implemented now, it's a fantastic initiative. And, you know, I was having this conversation with colleagues where what the AFC FTA is trying to do now is to create one unified trading block for Africa. Mm. The way you have a world trade organization that creates a single trading block for the world, we're trying to do that for Africa. And uh, in doing that, you remove the barriers that limit two countries being able to share resources, mm. right, and leverage off of each other's individual powers to rise you know, the continent out of, uh, you know, it's to basically grow the economic state of the, of con the continent. Of continent yeah. um, so for me, the trade agreement is a fantastic idea. It's basically going to now see us enhancing how countries within the continent collaborate with each other when it comes to trade. Hmm. Well, there's a big dirt of transnational highways and all that, passageways and all that. So how is this going to, going to benefit us? I know that the, this, the, the president at the moment, or the government, is trying to do 
I think a bridge or a road from Nigeria to Niger. Is it, is it a train? <laughs> is it a railroad or real? something? Is it a railway <laughs> and all that? So I know people are talking about it, but I'm seeing it from the economic angle. Mm -hmm. So what's your take on that? The absence of transnational passageways. Um, for one, I mean the government. Our government has a lot of uh, ideas that we're waiting to see manifest. Hopefully that can uh, <laughs> manifest soon enough. But um, the interesting thing is part of the blockages with the transnational movement of uh, cargo or transnational trade is that there's no collaboration. And I'll give an example. Um, one of two of the countries that we work in, which is Kenya and Uganda, um, because Uganda does not have, it's completely landlocked. It doesn't have a seaside port. So what they do is they have partnered with the Kenyan government where because all the cargo, exactly, all, all the cargo that's destined to Uganda, <coughs> will receive right. it in Mombasa, and then you will transport it from Mombasa by road hmm. to Uganda. And because there is that understanding and that collaboration, there are a number of clauses that um, power that agreement where our cargo must not stay a specific amount of time in, in the airport. The port. If, you, if you're moving across the border, hmm. there should be specific documents that should be provided, the clearing of the documents for, from the authorities, whether the Kenyan authorities or the Ugandan authorities, should also be seamless as well, right? So that that whole transaction is seamless for both government um, agencies. Hmm. So it's less about the infrastructure that would power that and more about the collaboration because I'm pretty sure can it be the roads... The highways between Kenya and Uganda have existed for eons of years, mm -hmm. right? And are probably, I mean, I'm pretty sure they're not in perfect state, right? <laughs> but they make it work because mm. there is the collaboration from the government. Exactly. So, so yeah, you know what? You know what? Yeah, wait, it's, now, now, <laughs> it's still not going to work out. So yeah. why did why are we a part so of the So I will tell you why that is. <clears throat> if you have this kind of collaboration between Kenya and Uganda, mm. if this agreement exists, you can have this kind of collaboration between Ghana and Nigeria, yes. Nigeria and Benin Republic, mm -hmm. right? For example, if there's a situation where I am shipping my cargo from Europe and the port in Apapa is congested. I can just ship to Benin Republic. Exactly. And know that it will arrive there and I would get free passage mm. of my cargo from Benin into Nigeria. Without, any, without hassle. any hassle. And that's what people have been doing, even with cars. Mm -hmm. They stopped shipping their cars when they did the increased tariffs and all that. But you know what? Let's just take a break. <laughs> we'll continue the conversation. Stay with us. We'll be right back. <laughs> 